So I'm a PhD in organic chemistry, and I work at MIT as a research scientist and a professor. Then I went in the venture capital business as a scientific director, looking for startups all around the world. And then I worked for 10 years at the Institut Pasteur in biology and research and application as director of applied research. And then I joined the uh, Cité des Sciences de l'Industrie, where I work now as an advisor to the president. And I created my own company in consulting for high tech called Biotics International. And I wrote several books. The latest one is called Surfing Life, Surfer la vie, which is not a book about surfing, but a book about the philosophy of life and a, mostly a politician book, a politic book. So what I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon, and it will be in two parts. The first part, there'll be no slides, only talking. And uh, I will uh, present an idea, a theme which is linked to the global brain, that I've developed the concept of the global brain since 1975. And I want to thank Francis to translate and uh, put my book, it was translated, but put my book on the internet called The Macroscope in 1975, then I, again, in the global, in the, in the symbiotic man, in 1995, again, talked about the global brain, what I call the Cybion, Cyb or cybernetics and bios for biology, and in my, one of my latest book called And Man Created Life, <coughs> published in May 2010, I talk about the, the MOP, the planetary macroorganism. So all I'm going to tell you is linked to this, in, in, in five, five parts. I will, I will go from the, from the internet to biology and from biology to sociology because it's a very wide subject, the global brain topic. So the first question, and it's all the title, you received the summary of my speech also and the references. Okay, so Weaver can provide you with a summary of my speech, which is this summary plus References you can click on if you send them to you on the internet. You, they're clickable. They're clickable references. So the the title is Internet Epigenetics: How to Modify Internet DNA from Inside. Got that? So I have to explain things in biology for those who are not familiar with biology. So the first part of my talk is what is the first part of my talk is what is Internet DNA? Where is it? And can we modify Internet DNA from inside? And if we can, who can? The internets, organizations, countries, companies. So first, let's ask the question, is there a, an Internet DNA? You've heard that people talk about the DNA of a company the DNA of a country, which are all the specific things which makes a company what it is, a country what it is, and it's a virtual world to talk about the DNA of a company or the DNA of a country, but the DNA of the internet exists. It's not like the double helix, obviously, but it's made of uh, operating system, it's made of TCP IP, the internet protocol, it's made up of uh, search engines, browsers, uh, social networks, all this together constitute the internet DNA which has been produced by people like Vinton Cerf, by uh, Mark Andrian Sen, by uh, Tim Berners-Lee. They were the promoter, the, the creators of most of the internet DNA. And this internet DNA has evolved constantly, co-evolved. The co-evolution concept is very important. Internet co-evolved with us, and we co-evolved with the Internet <coughs> DNA. But the question is, can, can we modify it from inside? Not being a programmer, not by being a specialist, but just by being a user, an internet, as we call ourselves. And I coined a word that I will use quite often, the word of proletarians, proletarians, you know that Karl Marx is called proletarians, those who fight against the capital and are only uh, paid on the payroll, and there is a conflict between the capital and, and the working class. The proletarians, and I created the word 
1994, I think, called the Pronetarians. The Pronetarians are us, those who are for and on the net. Pronetarians. Proletarians of all countries unite. Have you said for the proletaire de tous les pays, unissez-vous. Donc, we are the actors by every function, posting something on Facebook, putting a photograph on, on Flickr, sending a mail to somebody, storing that mail somewhere. We reprogram constantly the operating system of the internet. We are part of what we call a metagenome. A metagenome is a global information system, storable and modifiable. Now, the strange word in my title is epigenetics. You know all about genetics. Genetics is a DNA program which programs life. Every living thing, a flea, an elephant, or us have DNA programmed by life. But not only. Epigenetics is the difference between the script of a play and the play. DNA will be the script, epigenetics will be the play. The difference between DNA and epigenetics is like a scale of music with musical notes as DNA. But the symphony that you were able to play with the scale of music is like epigenetics. It's a qualitative jump into something completely different with another dimension. So that's what epigenetics globally is. But what, what is it in reality? Epigenetics, in short, is the capability to modulate DNA expression through behavior. The capability to modulate DNA expression through behavior. Your behavior, five major <coughs> behavior of your life, five things. Nutrition, exercise, management of stress, pleasure, and social network of friends, family, and professionals, all those five things, if they are in a harmonious way, will contribute to produce inside your body hormones or peptides, products which will go on DNA and open up some doors to copy DNA to messenger RNA and messenger RNA to proteins or enzymes, or close some doors. Like a cooking recipe, a book with cooking recipes, and uh, you have one chapter which is open, you can make a, a, a cake, but then if you glue this chapter and open up another one, you can make a, a, a tart or a, a pie. So DNA has drawers or chapters which can be opened or closed. The big question is what opens or closes those chapters? And the answer is the behavior, your behavior. And the changes are very, very quick in one week. I'll show you in a, on a slide later our DNA is a, has a fractal form like internet and many many genes of DNA which could be far apart as it's so compact are very close together so one effector one small molecule will make an enormous change very quickly so epigenetics can have changed on your life and the global life of the internet which is the purpose of my talk in a few weeks in a week or so in a few weeks very 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 fast change that's that's very important to understand that Another example I want to give you is uh, bees or ants. Uh, bees, uh, larvae of bees are all born with the same genetic information. But if you feed larvae with royal jelly, they become queen, which are very different. They're big, they live longer, they make eggs. They, say, they have all the same DNA, but that DNA will be woken up or put to sleep for changing the organism itself. Ants, you have a colony of ants with workers and warriors. If you have 20% of warriors and 70% of workers, you take off half of the warriors and half of the workers will transform into warriors. So epigenetics is the key to modify the body and I'm applying the concept of epigenetics to internet DNA all along my speech and how we can modify this internet, this DNA from inside. One of the most recent discoveries made last September, this September, published in the journal Nature, 
was made by a group of labs around the world called ENCODE. If you Google that, you'll find them, ENCODE, I-E-N-C-O-D-E-E, ENCODE. A group of people have analyzed the complete DNA of humans and animals and find out that only 2% of DNA codes has the program for protein and enzyme, only 2%. So 98%, as we didn't know what it was doing, it was called junk DNA. But now ENCODE has proven that those 98% encrypt an enormous amount of switches. In fact, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an enormous closet full of switches. The switches which con constantly modulate the functioning of the body. And those switches are small molecules of RNA. Not DNA, big double helix of DNA, but tiny molecules of RNA which constantly interfere, it's called molecular interference, interfere with messenger RNA and stop it or amplify it. So it's very, very, very important discovery. Probably epigenetics is one of the most important discoveries of the last five or ten years. So if I understand it well, the switching on and off of a gene doesn't happen at the level of the DNA? Ah, the it's more, it's, RNA. it's not as simple. No, the switching of the gene, the switching of the gene is mostly responsibility of small molecules of RNA. Mostly. And the way it works is that DNA is covered with a sort of a protecting cover called histones. Histones are proteins, like a wire, a electric wire is covered with plastic. Histones protect DNA. And methylation of histone or acetylation of histone will either open or close the gaps. And what will amplify a gene or make it to see, even if it has been translated, are small molecules of RNA which will interfere with messenger RNA, recognize the antisense RNA, recognize the sequence. When the sequence is recognized, I'll show you a, a slide later in the discussion. It, the, a protein called RIS comes up and chops out messenger RNA, which is inefficient. So there will be no translation of messenger RNA in protein. So our life is constantly controlled by those chemical switches, small molecules of RNA. Okay, second part. Still in biology, we need to understand how internet acts as a fluid brain. The brain is fluid. The brain is not a black box with input-output processing that we saw 20, 30, 40 years ago. Varela and Donald Hebb, you find that in the references I gave you, have shown that in fact the, the, the brain constantly reconfigurates itself. It adapts to interaction with outside environment and it adapts to interaction with inside environment. Because the brain is not hierarchically superior to the body controlling the body. The brain is the body and the body is the brain. The brain is inside the body and the body is inside the brain. To give you an idea, maybe you've heard of that, we have 100 million neurons in our intestine. 100 million neurons in the guts, we call it the enteric brain or the second brain. So there is a constant regulation. The body is fluid because of epigenetics. The brain is fluid. It has been shown that the synapses constantly configure themselves. And the um, internet is, it works exactly like the same thing. It's fluid. It reconfigures itself. Somebody downloads the software, likes it, sends it to other people. There's a lot of buzz. Uh, beta tester test it. They like it. They amplify it. They correct it. They change it. Send it back. Or they don't like it and it dies. So constantly, the internet is as fluid as the brain. And by the way, why I use this term fluid, it's part, uh, part of my book. My last book is on the fluid society, and this is where surfing comes into line. I use the metaphor of surfing in fluidity to transpose the movement of the surfer who has to anticipate, who has to predict, who has to balance its equilibrium to life. Life is a wave. We surf uh, the wave of life. We have to balance and to give, be on, and balance in equilibrium and to forecast and anticipate. So I mention in my book what I call the fluid society opposed to the pyramid, the rigid society of rapport de force. I talk about rapport de flux, flu, flow reports rather than force reports. 
and I, I oppose the pyramid view top down of the management governance of society to the transversal power of the fluid society. But well, that's in my book, you read it in my book. But let's come back to the fluid internet and the fluid brain. So the concept of the brain is that it is fluid, it reconfigures itself constantly, and two papers, which are the reference that I, would, I can show you, in fact, just right here. And two papers. This one, the theory of epigenetics of neuronal network by selective stabilization of synapses, has been proposed by Changeux of the Institute Pasteur in 1973 and Courage. They showed, they showed that neurons, young neurons, have receptors called labile, labile, labile. They move around the neurons. And then other neurons try to get in touch with other neurons by axons. And axons move around. You can see this in the neuron culture very well. They connect, they connect, and they connect on those receptors. And when the connection on the receptor is made, if there is a feedback which reinforces this connection because the neuron is doing something efficient in a chain of neurons, it will be stabilized. So, labile, L, stabilized, D, stabilized, S. And if the connection is not done because the neuron is not working really in real life, like um, uh, kids who were educated by wolves and they walk on their, on their, on their, on their uh, four paws and their brain doesn't develop the same way, it will never, the connection will never be made forever. Lost memory. So, labile, stable, dégénéré, LSD, like LSD, like the drug. So, you can remember it. So, that's what Changeux described in his very famous paper here in 73 Theory of Epigenesis of Neuronal Network by Selective Stabilization of Synapses. And I took this idea to the internet in 2001. Thank you, Francis. Here, in the Global Brain Group. I published a paper, which is in your references, Increase of Complexity of Internet Interfaces and the Darwinian Process of Selective Stabilization of Internet Nodes. What I describe in this paper is that by, like the fluid brain, Internet adapts constantly by Darwinian selection of links, URL, uh, information highways, blogs, sites, <coughs> All this will remain or will be destroyed if it's not used. So it's a dynamic Darwinian process. Uh, there, there are uh, company financing startup called uh, Kickstarter.com or Kiss Kiss Bank Bank, which don't expect money out of the money they give to people starting startups. So there is an internet philosophy of doing it for the community and not only for market. So the selective process works on that. It works, it's fun, it's interesting, let's do it or let's drop it. So this is the thing, the second part I wanted to tell you still in biology about the fluid internet, the fluid brain and the constant reconfiguration of synapses by a Darwinian process. The third thing I want to tell you and still in biology and then I will move about the major topics of the sociology of, of the internet is what uh, can be called the intuitive internet. The intuitive internet idea has been brought about by Tim Berners-Lee, one of the inventors of the web, in what we call Web 3.0, the Web 3.0, which is the intuitive brain. Why? Because the new search engine will not only classify the results of a search, of a query, as we call it, um, by a, in a linear way, on putting at the top the most quoted website with a, a, a software called PageRank that Google has commercialized all around the world. But it will use different approach to give meanings to words, to what you've done before, what your profile, more profiling on you, more information on your search, and that it will work in a more serendipity, more intuitive way of giving you results which are coordinated with other search and other concepts. So this concept of the intuitive brain is extremely interesting because uh, it tells us that we have projected on the internet some of the capability of communication of our own brain. Let me just explain this and 
uh, you see that it's, it's quite relevant to the internet epigenetics. The first thing we know now is uh, that the internet, the, the brain communication, there are two major ways of communication. There's a way which functions like a cable phone network, through cable, called axons, and linking neurons together. And we know that through uh, uh, depolarization of the axon, it's like in, in, in an electrochemical uh, communication system. And then there is something like the GSM, like the, the cellular phone, uh, through astrocytes, which we used to call glial cells. Astrocytes are cells which might transform into neurons, uh, sort of embryonic stem cells, and those astrocytes act as hubs, and the information will jump from one hub to the other much faster and much more parallel than by the cable route that point-to-point uh, -point telephone use in the other. We have those two, the dual system of communication inside the brain. Also that exists on the internet. On the internet we have uh, direct communication through high fiber to fiber, we have communication through satellite, communication through Wi-Fi, communication through Bluetooth, many different ways of communication mixed with each other, even more than in the brain. But that's a part of the capability to modify the internet DNA from inside, as I will show. And the second thing about the brain that I want to also stress is the hierarchy of our brain that we have externalized in the internet. The hierarchy of the brain is due to the work of MacLean. MacLean has shown that uh, we, we have, in fact, three brains three brains. One is the hypothalamus, the primitive brain. The second one, the second part is the here. The, the second part is the mesencephalus here. And the third part is the cortex. We know that the hypothalamus is a primitive brain, mostly connect, uh, fear, pleasure, hunger, thirst, the mesencephalus is the, collective, the collaborative brain. It contributes to nidification with birds, uh, um, uh, educating kids with mammals, and so on. And the cortex is the abstract brain uh, for symbols and abstraction. And uh, that the three layers are the oldest at the bottom and the more recent at the top. So in fact, what we've done is to, in a certain way, externalize this to internet, as we have collective intelligence, collaborative intelligence, and collective intelligence now. So connective intelligence is email, uh, forum, uh, chat, whatever. Uh, collaborative intelligence is uh, Wikipedia, or Linux, or collaborative uh, software, or called open source. And collective intelligence is crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing for instance, allows people of very different origin and, and, and uh, training to solve problems collectively much better than one person, uh, one specialist. It's called crowdsourcing. It's collective intelligence. So in fact, it's interesting to see that the fluid brain is linked to the fluid internet, and the internet is linked to our brain and modifies it. It's interesting to see that the hierarchy of the structure of the brain are trans, trans externalized into the internet. Therefore, my conclusion about this is that we are able, through co-participation, co-revolution, crowd something, change the DNA of the Internet from inside. And there are many proofs and many examples that it is possible. It's a big revelation for all of us that the DNA of the Internet can be changed not only by special specialist programmers or scientists or technologists, but by the proletarians, the internodes, the participants, acting collectively like epigenetics through our behavior will modify the expression of our Internet. Now, what does that change? That's the fourth point that I want to stress. Society at large that means factories, international organizations, governments, networks of whatever, huge lobbies, armies, the Vatican, all those things which makes the society and the global brain metabolism 
are now more and more linked through networks using, in a way or another, fast internet. High bandwidth or satellite or DSM phone or digital phone. There will be, there, there are more uh, telephone chips than people on the, on the world. Yeah. 7.5 billion people, there are 8.2 billion plus, comment vous appelez ça, les chips d'identification, IDT. Les plus personnels, ah, subscription. SIM card. SIM card, SIM card, thank you. And there is about 4.5 billion smartphones, which allows you to get the answer. So now, this civic, what I call, I tell people forget internet, it's finished. Oh, it just started. It's finished because it's part of the ecosystem in which we are, the informational ecosystem in what I call the, the digital civilization. So why I'm saying this is because more and more the metabolism of society, anabolism to produce, catabolism to destroy, in a constant turnover is regulated in a way or another by internet DNA. Like the catabolism and anabolism of our body, what we eat, what we reject, how we would maintain a balanced uh, steady state, as it's called in science, a steady state. It's regulated by the tiny switches that I mentioned on the 98% of DNA, mostly through um, micro RNA. So society also is, is working in a dynamic equilibrium constantly, uh, anabolism, catabolism, and so on, factories, products, services, government, energy, food, finance, all those huge circuits of the global brain, of the global organism, are uh, circulating in that way. So let me give you three examples to show you that it's already changing, already changing from inside, already changing. The first example, I call it, I call it the internet, not the internet, but the internet, E-N-E-R-N-E-T. -E -E and the second example I want to give you are, the co are called the mesh networks. And the third example I want to give you is the maker movement. Very briefly, what is it? Why is it so important? It proves that people, you, me, students, startupers, are changing the internet DNA from inside. First example is called the internet. What is it? The internet is the fact that people will be prosumers, prosumers of energy in the next 10 years. Prosumers means producer and consumer. Right now, we're submitted to totalitarian powers. The totalitarian power of a fossil fuel industry, gas, fuel, coal, and the totalitarian power, particularly in France and in Belgium, of the nuclear industry. Those two pyramids of power block us as citizens to be in real democratic energy world. We cannot produce, sell, and so on. But this is changing. Why? Because now we understand we have 12 renewable energy available, not in every country, but roughly 12, solar, biomass, uh, wind, water, waves, hydroelectricity, geothermal power, if you add it up, hydrogen, it's 12. But the key is to combine intermittent energies like sun and wind with permanent energy like biomass or hydroelectricity or geothermal power. Okay, so the, the whole new concept of energy is to combine a renewable energy force. But it's not finished. The second concept is to produce buildings, positive energy buildings. See, also whole city, as Jeremy Rifkin says, whole cities will become producing central power plants for electricity. Why? Because the concept is to produce a bit more of energy that you consume. If you have a bonus of energy that you don't consume, then you can share it. If you can share it, you disintermediate those pyramids, you go around. And what is the key to distribute this energy through the, it's the internet. The internet is called the smart grid. A smart grid is a grid of diffusion of electricity which is so smart enough because it contains sensors, captors, which communicate through a protocol called G3PLC, like the internet was before that passive and only point-to-point -point communication. But through TCP IP, internet became interactive. Same thing with a passive network to distribute energy. But now with DCPLC, all the sensors of the passive, net, the passive distribution network can become interactive and, and create a, an internet 
an internet de l'énergie, if you want, energy in peer to peer. So that is a revolution, changing the global organism from inside by us, by people. The second example uh, is called the mesh networks. What is it? The mesh network has been in use for quite a long time by uh, military, firemen, um, and rescue uh, medical units. They create by hubs locally a communication network which can be dismantled and disappeared after an accident, a tsunami, a burn, a bomb, whatever. But now it's becoming into the civil world, like Wi-Fi, which was first reserved to schools and to the Apple protocol. Now everybody has Wi-Fi and it started with young people. Same thing with mesh networks. The mesh networks is a self-organized communication network based on hubs, and the hubs is your smartphone. You can download on your smartphone a software called Commotion or another one which is Australian called Serval, S-E-R-V-A-L, which transforms your smartphone into a hub so a lot of people can access internet free, not going through the internet providers or the big communicators like <coughs> AT&T or Verizon or in France uh, or in Belgium, uh, Proxima or whatever. So that's a big change because people are changing the nervous system of the internet from inside by communicating with each other in a simple way and in a very cheap way. And the last example I want to give you is called the maker movement. The maker movement is a movement which is worldwide in five years. I mean, it's viral. It's going so quickly that it's amazingly fast. Young people around the world in hacker studios use 3D printers Printers would print objects, not only paper, but objects. It could be a, it could be a, a small uh, phone with the electronics around and you plug it together. It could be shoes. You can, you, Nike is going to help you print shoes at home with, the, with the 3D printers. You can print uh, plastic, uh, alloys, uh, ceramics, and many different objects. I don't want to get into it. If you have questions, you can ask me. So 3D printers, the, the price is going down is the basis of the creation of what we call Industry 2.0. Industry 2.1 is top-down pyramidal industry, centralized, generalized for everybody, distributed. Industry 2.0 is bottom-up, is, is destandardized, decentralized, personalized. And this is a revolution which is changing completely the internet DNA from inside as well. So those are the examples of what the prosumer can do to change the internet DNA and change society in the same way. Energy democracy would be a major change in our society. Industry 2.0 would be a major change in our society. Disintermediation of banks by peer-to-peer -to -peer banking. Disintermediation of insurance company by peer-to-peer -to -peer insurance. Disintermediation of education by co-education, intergenerational co-education, all this will change completely the way we work, the way we learn, the way we buy, the way we live. So this all examples will tell you that we can change internet DNA from inside. Now the last part is the most controversial one, is the control of internet DNA. Who controls internet DNA? I've said, with my reference to epigenetics, that all of us, as proletarians or internauts, globally have an effect on internet DNA without somebody reprogramming it. Okay, that you might understand, we'll discuss it later, in a minute, in fact, because I'm not all through. But there are people, organizations or countries, who want to control it for their own sake. Let me tell you, imagine seven lobbies. Seven lobbies. With Karl Marx, there were two, two forces against each other, capitalism and proletariat, two. Now, seven lobbies control the world and control politicians because they pay politicians re-elections. They control the world. Those seven lobbies are the financial lobby. The finances has become much bigger than industry. The second lobby is the lobby of... Um, uh, energy, nuclear and fossil. The third lobby is the lobby of arm, arms. The fourth are drugs, including tobacco. 
The fifth is pharmaceutical industry. The sixth is the agro-food industry, agro-food business. So those lobbies, I think I've said seven, maybe there are more or less. Mm -hmm. That doesn't matter really what it is. But those lobbies are the thing through which we, 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 should, we need to fight against them to be able to change society. But they are very, very strong. They don't want to change. And the politicians who are definitely pyramidally oriented uh, want to keep their power by using those lobbies who finance them and we give them power. So it's going to be a very big and difficult change. But who is changing it? Who is changing it? Again, who wants still to control on top of those lobbies and, and governments and countries? China. China has installed its own internet. Its own standard, their own software. And some countries like uh, Iran are some of the best hackers in the world. They can penetrate uh, the Pentagon, uh, the CIA, and so on. Um, other people look much nicer but want to control the internet. The name of this huge organization is called GAFA. G A F. Hey. Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. GAFA wants to control you. Google has 48 products which are free. But that freeness of product makes people invent, create flow on the internet. They take a little percent of every flow. They are brokers, make a huge amount of money. And Google wants you to have on your smartphone a Google screen every day every morning, for everything, for moving, for buying, for talking, for searching, everything. So GAFA is changing the internet DNA to their own profit, to profile you, to make you buy more, to sell more advertising, and so on. So in fact, it's not exactly epigenetics, it's genetic engineering. Yes? What would be the equivalent of GAFA in the brain, in the human brain? Obsession, obsession, obsession. Les tocs, les tocs. La toc, ça veut dire comment ça se dit en français? Les tocs, trouble, obsessionnel. Non, 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 les sides. It's mental. There's no a region of like GAFA in the brain. Uh, that that could be if you want in the brain for somebody who's got Parkinson. A little part of the brain which will control your movement, so that's a dedicated part, but mostly it's mental. It's, it's mentally diseased, like schizophrenia, megalomania, uh, paranoia. It's not a lo localized no, part. No, it's not a localized part. And, and internet is become sick too. There is schizophrenia of internet, paranoia of internet, megalomania of internet. So we need to cure this. We need to avoid GAFA or the Iranians or the Chinese or the seven lobbies to take power on us by controlling internet DNA. And what do we see? We see that this movement is started in the world. You heard about the Indigné, you heard about Occupy Wall Street, you heard about the Printemps Arabe, the Printemps Arabe in Canada. What is it? Those are young people between 25 and 35 who were born with the internet or using internet, using social networks, protesting against those seven lobbies and the government who are using them for their own power. And you've seen that those indignés, like uh, Stéphane Essel called them, have changed totalitarian regime. I'm not saying that it's better, this is coming now, right? I'm not, I'm not saying that. But they've been able to topple down totalitarian regimes by getting together and protesting. In Spain, the indignés just sit in the street. They're not like a political movement or a union. Um, they're just there with television showing that they protest against the power of uh, uh, representative democracy. They don't believe in representative democracy anymore because they don't trust the politicians, that they feel some of them are corrupt, some of them are only working to be re-elected, and they believe in participatory democracy. Participatory democracy and not only representative democracy, even if the two will be complementary for a long time. Like the pyramid way of governing and the transversal way of governing will continue for a long time. Yes, sure. Okay, let's not be too pessimistic. No. Let, let's see the changes. I'm like you. I see that the structure resists, that the politicians, the pyramid, the lobbies are still there and resisting. But I give you an example 
based on what you said about uh, solar energy. In France, you could install solar panels and resell it to EDF and get money out of it mm -hmm. and pay, in fact, some of the facture of the electricity. But now, <laughs> it was so good for the people that the EDF didn't like it, so they raised the price and then these, a lot of uh, solar panel industry um, failed and uh, are in liquidation and, and the Chinese are taking the market everywhere. But with a smart grid, it creates different possibility because you can store energy decentralized way. You can store energy, for instance, if you have wind power, the wind produces electricity. When there is uh, wind, it pumps water like they do in Denmark, in hills. And then the water, was there's no wind, the water goes down and make turbine turn. That's uh, what I always thought one of the simplest way to store energy is with water because yes. the, the yeah. potential energy of a lot of water that's high. That's it. But let me continue on answering this question. Americans store energy uh, by CAES, compressed air energy yeah. storage. Yeah. The wind turbine pump yeah. air under the aquifer. And this air, compressed air, can be mixed with gas and produce a better yield to produce vapor and electricity. Another way is hydrogen. Hydrogen is storage of sun. Uh, in Corsica, the project MIRT allows 10,000 square meters of solar panel to produce electricity to do the electrolysis of water, H2O. So you produce hydrogen, you produce oxygen, you store the hydrogen into a tank, and then at night, this hydrogen is put in a fuel cell and produce electricity for 3,000 houses. Mm -hmm. So there is a combination of solar power at day and fuel cell at night because hydrogen acts as a storage tank. And my example I want to give you is on Mauritius. Mauritius Island is 1.5 million inhabitants. I am the advisor of the Prime Minister of Mauritius on this, or on my, all my jobs. Uh, on the, what I call the Projet Maurice Il Durable, Mauritius the Sustainable Island. The project is to have the whole 1.5 million people country be autonomous in energy in 2050. 2014 will be 75% autonomous by using the 12 energy connected. But now I've sold to him, as I sold the project Maurice Il Durable, the project Smart Mauritius. Smart Mauritius is smart grid, smart meter, smart phone. There will be smart meters in every home. And smart car. Communic Communicate and smart cars, smart, smart electric cars, communicating with their people so they can regulate the electricity. Then I had a law which I helped to pass at the Congress and the Parliament called Small Independent Power Producer, telling that people with a wind turbine, with water, with biogas could sell their energy to the Central Electricity Board. They said no, no, because you're going to perturbate the passive grid. Uh, solar panels, wind, create a different frequency, you're going to destroy everything. So we allow 5 megawatts, Mauritius is very small, it's 300 megawatts altogether. Mm. So we allow you to produce 5 megawatts, we'll pay you for that. And those, you know, those people, the small independent power producers, say we can produce 30 megawatts, 10% of Mauritius uh, need. No, 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 we can't. Do it. But the smart grid will allow that. The smart grid will allow the small independent power producer to produce about 10%, which is a very politically and viable democratic thing that the small independent power producer might produce 10% of the electricity of the whole country. And the storage can be decentralized. For instance, Mauritius wants to introduce electric cars and hybrid cars. They slow down the custom rate for, the, for hybrid and electric cars. In France, the forecast is 1 million electric cars in 2020, which is not much compared to all the cars, but it's already 1 million. An electric car stores 10 kilowatt hour, 10 kilowatt per hour of electricity. A car stays about 95% of its time in a garage or in the streets, 95 average. So 10 kilowatt hours multiplied by 1 million makes 10, 10 gigawatt, not 10 megawatt, but 10 gigawatt of electricity, which is the equivalent of the production of 10 nuclear reactors. So through vehicle to grid, again the smart grid, you can resell your electricity to the grid, not to the company, not to EDF or British or Belgian or whatever, Monsieur Albert Frère. 
but you, you can resell electricity to the grid. And vehicle to grid, the calculation is that you can make about $3,000 to $4,000 a year just by seeing electricity. I finish so the conclusions and we open up the, the discussion, which has already started. So there are people who are fighting to, to control internet DNA. There are your other people who are fighting to preserve the independence of changing by epigenetics uh, the internet DNA. So the global behavior, my, my conclusion is that the global behavior of collective proletarians together might modify the internet DNA for the better work of the global brain. Uh, and there is also, we can discuss that epigenetic heredity, heredité des caractères acquis, it's a very interesting question, we can discuss that. And we, could, we, 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 we can change it through what I call symbionomic evolution, increasing complexity, but this I leave it for the discussion now. Thank you very much. Thank you.